And welcome to the session. Um, I am so happy to be doing this with you because teaching about Africa right from the beginning of school um, and all the way through is so important, particular in our environment of white supremacy. And um, so for me to get to know you, maybe you to get to know each other, if you would put in chat your name, uh, your grade or subject, and um, why you've chosen this workshop. That doesn't, yeah, why you've chosen the workshop. Barbara, would you like me to read some of the... Yeah, no, I think uh, I'll read a couple of the responses. I won't have time to read everybody's, so I'll just pick a few of them out. Um, we teach Timbuktu in fourth grade, um, and I'm looking for a way to adapt social studies to be more globally inclusive. Huh? Um, you know which one I Google. Yeah. Is there a problem? No. And... I teach seventh grade. I want to broaden my knowledge so my kids can broaden theirs. Um, and I'm from Boston. Hey, Boston, next door, grades three to six. And um, next year, you're going to do the African continent in six. Oh, get in touch with Elsa Vija at BU's African Studies program. She's amazing. Um, this is what she does professionally. She works with schools. And um, let's see, I teach STEM, I'm a professor at Howard, um, Elsa's a good friend, and I'm doing science and technology, and of course, environmental science comes into there as well. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm glad you're here. Before you're, we start, I want to thank Elsa Vija, because she did so much to support my putting this workshop together. And then to thank uh, Beth Jones, a PhD student at BU, who's my tech host, and then Laura uh, Marino at Wisconsin, who's the backup tech, tech host. So I think we are in good hands. So now let's take a look at the topics. On to the next slide, please. We're not gonna have a topic on racial stereotyping. It's just gonna be woven into everything that we do all the way. So what we're gonna be focusing on mostly is making connections, teaching content and concepts. And then finally, we're gonna have a lovely time listening to uh, two stories from Africa um, about environmental justice and environmental activism. And uh, Anyway, I love them both, so it'll be fun to see them again. Now, and this will be interactive. No matter if you're a kindergarten teacher or you're a high school teacher, all of your students and you, and I think, and I know still I, have drunk the Kool-Aid. We all have stereotypes about Africa. As Beverly Daniel Tatum said, we all, we breathe polluted air. None of us asked for the polluted air we breathe. And she was talking, of course, about racism then, but it's our job as teachers to clear the air as much as possible in your classroom, among the other faculty and so forth. There is in the chat room shortly, or perhaps now, a full resource list. And I'll mention it several times as we go along because it's got it expands on what we're doing and it's got also um, the details of what we're doing. So now let's go on to the first uh, making connections piece. 
There are three pieces to it. And let's start with hospitality. Before you turn the slide, I'd like to tell people my experience of hospitality in Africa, just across the continent. Hospitality is at a level that I've never seen in the experience in the United States. People, if you go to someone's home, and I don't mean just if you are a white visitor, if you go to someone's home, they will send a small child to the local shop to go get some more milk or to get some cookies or something else. Because when you walk in the house, they wanna have something for you to eat and something for you to drink. And I experienced that again and again. The idea is connected with Ubuntu. It's an idea saying, you are welcome, you are seen, and now we'll get to know each other more and whatever happens next. So when I have hospitality here, do hospitality here, someone comes by, this is what I might serve, one of these things. Coffee, of course. Uh, might have some oranges or bananas, though people don't usually want them. Chocolate cookies, just the thing. And those are cashews up there on the left. Now you might go, oh, that's all nice. And when I do a workshop for teachers, they think it's real nice, especially if it's after school. But that's not quite the full point. You can do this in your classroom without the coffee or something else. And what you're doing is introducing students to Africa. Bananas and oranges are grown and seen all over the continent. Uh, and in little street markets, on the sides of roads, and of course, um, in groves. Cashews is a cash crop in uh, Mozambique. Chocolate originated in Mexico and is primarily grown in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire in West Africa. So just by having a little bit of food, bringing a banana in, bananas in, you're telling, giving kids a connection with some place that they think is so far away and has nothing to do with them. So now we're gonna go on to a little bit more with connections. So now, oh, go back to the other one, please, <laughs> Beth. I forgot to say before we look at this slide is for you to think about for that next slide, the bingo game. It has 24 clues for the 25 places of African connections. And it's questions that you answer to, um, yes or no. So um, have you seen President Trump on TV? We'd all say yes. Now, what I'd like you to do is to think about what African connections you think you'll see on the next uh, on the bingo card before we go there. Think about it, jot it down, um, put it in chat. Okay. On to bingo itself then. Here's the bingo board. It is in the resource list. And in the resource list, you can go to it and it's in order, <laughs> the numbers. And what I'd like to do is I'm gonna call out some of the numbers and I'll say the number and I'll say the question. And then if you would uh, raise your hands, if you can say yes to what I'm asking about. So number six, um, have you ever studied pyramids? Raise your hand. Yep, yep, yep. I see a lot of hands raised, good. Okay, number 10, jazz. Have you listened to jazz? Do you love jazz the way I do? Raise your hands, if, you don't have to love it as I do, just if you've listened to it. Jazz is actually a Kikongo word and um, jazz has deep roots in Africa as well as does rock and roll, 
the rumba and a number of other kinds of dances and music. So that's jazz. Now, number 14. Do you use your cell phone? Did you use your cell phone today? Raise your hand. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see hands raised there. Okay, in Africa, you will see everybody seems to have a cell phone, no matter how big a place or how small a village. And the kinds of cell phones people, the poorer people usually have is, or maybe even the richer people, is cell phones that you just can recharge with money. So you don't have to spend a lot of money to have the, the level of cell phones we have. But here's the thing, over 500 million Africans use cell phones to send money or to receive money. That's not something our kids would ever think of. So there's a lot of adeptness to their people's use of cell phones. And it's very common. Now, on to the next one. Number 16. Have you had coffee today? Raise your hand if you've had coffee today. Yep, yep. Let's see. Oh, not everybody has. You know that you're not telling. Um, so those are just, oh, number 22, the final one that I'll do right now. Have you eaten yams or okra? Again, raise your hand. And um, many kinds of yams and okra itself, as well as a number of other fruits and vegetables are African in origin and were brought here and were, began to be cooked as something delicious by the enslaved people. And then that passed into the more general public. So um, we are connected in that way too. Now, as you've seen, we have connections here that relate to slavery, that relate to music, that relate to the Egypt. And Egypt is in there so that you remember that there are pyramids and Egypt is part of Africa. Um, and we've got cell phones and there's um, gold and there are diamonds. So it's all different kinds of connections and that's part of the point. It's not just connections, but all kinds. Now, let's see, where are we? So now put in the chat, if you don't mind, any things that you don't know what the connection is with Africa. Why is that clue up there? So if you just put the clue number in the chat and then I'll tell you. And it will be on the, um, it will be, this explanation comes with a game. So chat. Okay. All right. Okay. Number seven, have you smelled a clove? Um, Tanzania and Mozambique are two major, the two major sources of cloves in the world today. Now, number 21, have you seen a baton twirler? Bat baton twirling has two origins, one in Western Africa and the other in the Anglo-American world. Um, and six, someone who's planted a tree. Ah, oh, you're gonna learn a lot about someone who's planted a tree. Uh, a little bit later, so I won't spoil that. Uh, let's see. Anyone else? I do 12. Ah, the word guy, the word guy, the word phony, um, and a number of other African words are from Wolof, W O L O F, which is the main language in Senegal. And there's a dispute over who originated the word okay. Some argue it also came from Wolof in Senegal. Others argue that it came from Scotland and other places. Everybody wants to claim the word okay. But for sure, um, guy and phony. And um, so it's in whatever we even speak. Hey guys, let's get together. Hey guys, could you be a little bit quieter? Uh, let's see, 12. Any that I've missed, 19, did I miss that? Uh, Picasso. Picasso and a number of the other 
um, artists from the first half of the 20th, 20th century in Europe were inspired by African uh, sculpture. And Picasso and the others went to um, a museum in Paris that specialized in art from Africa, art and history from Africa, Asia, and Latin America. So, for example, um, what is it called? The Demoise Demoiselles, the young ladies, these long, thin figures where you mainly see the outline in different colors of several women. That is very clearly a West African piece. Now, let's see anything else. But you'll see the rest, the ones that I haven't had time to talk about, they're all in the, on the resource list. Now, I want to turn to what are some three key pedagogical approaches for teaching about Africa. Okay, let's hear the first one or all three, visuals. When I taught high school, African studies to high school students quite a while ago, after I, we'd done a little bit of de-stereotyping Africa, which I don't recommend as a way to start a class, but that's what I did then. Um, I talked about how there were cities in Africa right now in 2020, almost 50% of Africans live in cities. That's just mind blowing for anybody who hasn't been there uh, recently or who doesn't know a lot yet. And this high school student boy said to me, Miss Brown, if Africa has uh, cities, what do they look like? I love the if, I mean, talk about crazy. And so, we realized we needed to bring some African films into the into um, the program. So we brought in a lot of African films so they could see um, Africa because without visuals, they won't be able to undo some of their stereotypes. Now the VVC has another V, African voices. Uh, you know, Growing up in this country, all of us have heard very few, relatively few, not all of us, many of us have heard very few black voices, black authoritative voices or black story, stories but with black characters. The same thing fits with Africa. We need to hear African voices it makes Africa real, it makes it come alive, and you're hearing it from the source. So African voices are crucial. And you can get African voices in music, you can get African voices in literature, you can get African voices list, um, meeting Nelson Mandela, which is a visual too. There are just all kinds of ways to hear African voices. And you can hear children's voices. Um, in a lot of their enormous number of quality children's books with children with African children as the main characters that are award winning. So you need visuals, voices, and the C, which we've already been doing is connections. Because until students feel connected with Africa, they won't quite take it seriously. If they're connected with Africa, they'll feel at home with it. They won't consider it distance. When I lived in Botswana, there was one word for something over there, and that was kwa. And then if it was far away, you'd say kwa. Well, our students think of Africa as kwa. But in all the foods we've been talking about, and all those um, connections, Africa is kwa. Africa is actually part of our life. And students need to see that. Um, it makes Africa more normal. And that's one of the stereotypes kids about, have a, about Africans. They're exotic, they're not understandable. I can't know, there's no way to really know what th their lives are like. Um, so use the VVC as you look at materials and use that to bring out some of those materials. But none of the VVC will matter 
unless one other thing happens, and that's you. You are the one who will make this unit, your unit, or your teaching in the year, across the year, um, compelling and exciting. I know you've all had, because I too have had both in college and at middle school, kids who have come up to me year, a year later, two years later, three years later and said, I've never forgotten. And it's something, some topic that you talked about, something in particular that you said, it's your enthusiasm, your commitment to this, your enjoyment of this, your joy that will make it all the difference. So never forget yourself and never thank your, forget thanking yourself. Now, let's move to the next slide. Now we're gonna move on from approaches to teaching Africa to some key content and concepts. The first one is an odd question. It says, how big is Africa? Why do we need to know how big Africa is? Let's go to the next slide. So, um, now let's, I want, we're gonna play with how big it is by using a particular map called the true size map. And that's what we're gonna start with. So put in uh, the chat room, um, suggestions of places that you would like to see inside of Africa. And let's not start with this biggest countries in the world, China and Canada, and the next biggest one, one of the next biggest, uh, the United States. So if you'd remove United States, China and Canada from, from that map. Um, okay, what would you like to see inside? Put it in chat. Okay, chat. Okay, oh, there's another huge one. Australia, some people call it a continent, but there it goes. Yeah, plenty of room left over. What else would you like to put in? Someone else make a suggestion. Okay, Ireland. Take Ireland. Oh, right there where Tunisia is. Okay, what else? One way to do this is to do it the countries where your students are from. Ah, Germany, go for it. And notice how Germany shrinks as it moves south because countries fairly far north of the equator are um, made oversized because the equator usually on a map is not in the center of the map between north and south. And um, neither is it here. So what else? Tajikistan, okay. This, um, where you can find this map is in your resource um, guide, Brazil. Oh, now there goes a big one. It's like I'm rooting for them. Okay, yeah, that's fine. We can see that there's plenty of room left over. Okay, now I want to take uh, take um, Greenland, which is famous for being shown too big on a map. So let's put in Greenland and see what happens to Greenland. See how big it is? Now watch it go into Africa. Whoop, 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 whoop. There it is. And we still got all of Southern Africa, or we still got North Africa and half of Southern Africa left over. So you can put in France. You know, talk about the quote, important countries in the world. The news where we get our news from is France and England. So throw in the United Kingdom and then we'll stop there. Okay, now 
Before we go to the next slide, I'd like to hear your reactions in chat um, because that seems to be the easiest. Uh, there will be a link, someone asked if there will be a link to the guide in the chat or later. Beth, what's the answer? Sorry, everyone. Uh, yes, I'll send it at the end. Okay. Now, someone mentioned that Cape Verde is not shown on this map. Oh, there are a lot of maps that don't give Cape Verde the honor or the islands, um, the smaller islands in the um, Indian Ocean, like Mauritius and, and the Seychelles. So uh, I can't apologize for it because I didn't do it, but I'm sorry for it. And I'm glad you pointed it out. Um, I think students will find it interesting. I don't see Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. Let's put Sri Lanka in the true size and see if it comes up. Beth, if you could. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, what else? Ah, uh, someone's shocked by Greenland. I'm shocked every time. You know, one thing you can do is any map that you look at, size the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere on the map and see if the equator that's supposed to go through the middle of the map, whether or not it's halfway up the map or if it's below halfway. Like in this map, it's still a through the countries that it should be go through. So it hasn't, hasn't been falsified in any kind of way there, but it's been falsified in terms of the size of the Northern Hemisphere. What the deal is, um, a man named Mercator, hundreds of years ago, when the Europeans were trying to figure out how to um, sail to North America, he made this map for them for navigation. He didn't give a hoot about anything south of the equator, so he shrunk it. And that's why we end up thinking that Africa's small, because if you look on a map like this, United States looks huge, China looks huge, Russia looks huge. They all are large, but they're not as large as they are on most maps. Um, if you happen to have a Peters projection, or an equal areas projection of some sort, that will be more accurate. And so for middle school, this is a, um, a good thing to talk about, is check your maps. And they can check their maps online and see what they find. Um, I think that would be, uh, yes. And of course, maps are distorted by being a sphere. What I've often thought of doing is asking kids in elementary school, bring in, um, say, something big and round, maybe it's, a, maybe it's a grapefruit, maybe you can find something bigger and cut it into two halves, right? Northern hemisphere and Southern hemisphere, and then try and flatten them and have kids try and figure out how do you flatten them and still have no spaces in between. And that's the problem with maps because what we're doing is we're flattening something and it's not really possible to flatten some, a sphere. But the, the Peters projection and the equal areas projections all do relative size. So that the relative size of the places there um, are the relative size that they are in reality. Now, oh, the other thing, of course, that does the Mercator map, it's a Eurocentric map. It's a map that doesn't care about the Southern Hemisphere. It's a map that doesn't mind that the Europeans and the United States and Canada are made larger than they are. And that's a part of racial stereotyping. Okay. Oh, before we go on, let's just say. No, let's go on and take a look at uh, this map. This is a map we uh, produced at at Boston University, um, you're available to buy it. Um, you can also find it online. 
it shows how big Africa is. By the way, because we've all lived with these distorted ideas of how big places are, I've had, when I used to work at the African Studies Center at BU, I'm retired, um, I've had people from Mali, people from South Africa go, looked at the map and go, you're kidding, it's that big? I didn't know it was that big. Um, so there it is. And you could move African countries to different parts on the true size map. <coughs> so, and yes, Cape Verde is not on the map and neither are most of the islands in the Indian Ocean. Cape Verde would be too far out. And um, anyway, we made that decision. I don't know if it's the right one, but we made that decision about 15 years ago. Now, before we go on to, before we take a look at this map some more, wait, where else? Sorry. I'm, okay. I want to ask you a simple question for you to answer in chat in a few words. Why does size matter? Or as a middle schooler might, might ask you, so what that Africa is that big? Does it matter to me? It does matter, and so why? Put your ideas in chat. All right, uh, I've seen some answers that I've never seen before when I've asked this question. Um, you, you as a group are more attuned to um, white supremacy and ethnocentrism. Um, and I think, our, I hope our country is as well. Um, so I'm glad, and you've talked about dominance and uh, and bigger is better. Um, you know, we have the highest mountain, which we don't, and so forth and so on. Um, so there's one person who mentioned diversity, and that is one of the key things to ask your students about. So I'm gonna ask you about it. Diversity, in what ways, and this is for your chat, for chat too, in what ways is Africa diverse? You can list one or you can list several, but let's hear it. Okay, I can see a whole lot of things here. And I see some things that are repeated that people agree on. Languages. If it's diverse, there are a lot of languages. Um, just think of there being a lot of languages that, even within China. And there are a lot of languages um, 
in the US, so we have one official language. And um, Spanish is a very important second language. Environment, people mentioned. Nations, a lot of different countries. Um, no two Africans look alike. That is so true. Um, once you s stop paying attention just to black and white, you begin to notice differences in how people look from different parts of the continent. That doesn't always work, but it happens often. Someone mentioned tribes. Now tribes is a word that's been used a lot in the past. We don't use it very much anymore. And none of the scholars use it anymore. Let me give you an example of why. And this is a, a question. Let's see if you've got an answer for it. Name a country um, uh, near the United States. No, yeah. Now, Zulus are considered a tribe, though we now use the word ethnicity or ethnic group or nation. Um, they live all in South Africa. Zulus have one language, they have one king, they have one cultural tradition that goes back just 200 years and one piece of territory that they think of as theirs, though they live across South Africa too. Now, what part of Canada has that same similarity? of one language, one place, one 200 year old history. Quebec, absolutely Quebec. None of it, ha, yeah, yeah. Though so their history goes back longer. The French Africans are really only, Francophone Africans, the Quebecois are only really been here for about 200 years. And so if we don't call the Quebecois or the French Canadians a tribe, how can we call the Zulus a tribe? Oh, and by the way, both of them have over 10 million people. So anyway, that was, that's kind of fun. Um, and you can do that with high school students. I'm not sure about anybody else, but I think it's fun to think about. Uh, let's go on. So that's how big is Africa and that's uh, those concepts of diversity and of size are important. Let's go on to the next slide there. Beth, thank you. Now, here's another poster we created at BU. Do Africans see wildlife? Now that is the oddest question, at least it will be to your students because their answers are gonna surprise you. Let's look at the next slide where we can read what they said more easily. So Moss and Jai from Senegal said, I saw gorillas, antelopes, and other types of animals at the zoo in the capital. Belete Bizuna said, in Ethiopia, where I lived, we heard hyenas at night, sometimes lions, but never saw them. My father told me that as a boy, he sometimes saw giraffes and zebras. Talis Posi from Benin in West Africa, country I lived in, was the first country I spent two months in in Africa back in college. He said, I saw wildlife for the first time on a high school trip to the national park in the north of the country where many fewer people live. I was fortunate to see some monkeys. And now Pat Ongadengbe says from Nigeria, I saw wildlife for the very first time in Madison, Wisconsin. I wanted to see the lions and giraffes Americans were asking me about, so I went to the zoo. And Kenyan boys said in a class that I visited, um, we've never seen wild, large wild animals. I then asked them why, and they said, it takes, we don't have the money to go to the game park. We don't, they don't have the cars, they don't have the money for admission, even though it's low for Kenyans. Um, so they've never seen the large wild animals. What this big idea, not just these different, um, these different views that you see here, but it's fairly representative. 
most Africans have never seen wildlife. Think what that means that your students know a lot more about lions and giraffes and zebras uh, and hippos. They might even have some of these as stuffed animals and that they know almost nothing about Africans. That's just a devastating shame. And you can fix it. Thank you for that. Now, oh, where did I put my notes? Hang on a second, folks, while I look for my notes. Ah, here we are. Okay, the next slide, please, Beth. Now, let's, oh yeah. And where do students get some of their images? It's just not their stuffed animals. It's the movies that they love to see. I've never seen a, such a skinny man as Tarzan. And t um, an elementary school teacher and I, kindergarten teacher, an award-winning kindergarten teacher, that's the next slide, wrote an article on teaching about Africa and stereotypes and particularly focusing on wildlife. And the poster is in this article, which was published in Social Studies and the Young Learner. And so I welcome you to go read it. It will be in your resource um, list as well. Now let's go on to the next one. Here are some basic concepts from this last piece. Um, where we focused really on content, concepts. There is a danger in a single story. I imagine that a number of you have watched her TED talk, which is brilliant and it is uplifting because she's got a wonderful sense of humor and she says things sometimes so dryly about how um, other people look at Africa um, and her books, if you haven't read her books, um, her novels are fabulous. So she also wrote a, novel, a book called Why I Am a Feminist. So the danger of a single story, it's not just about danger about Africans. Think about it as a single story about people who have been misrepresented or stereotyped. Oh, she's in sped. That's, that's all she is. Oh, um, he doesn't speak English. That's all he is. And of course it goes on and on for the people who have been marginalized. So watch out for the single story. There's a terrific article for teaching with um, the danger of a single story, watching the TED talk. And um, that won't be on the, on the resource list because I forgot it, but you can go look for it probably somewhere. Second, Africa is enormously diverse. No single story tells the truth. Wildlife, keep it out of school except for occasional folk tales. And then if you haven't already, it's a good time to acquire some basic knowledge of the continent, the country, the place, or the history. Oh, that's right. When you talked about diversity, no one mentioned history or geography. There are places in Africa that had the wealth, some of the wealthiest empires in the world and largest, some of the largest ones. And there are places that had no kingdoms or empires that just had small scale societies. There are mountains, there's snow, there's heat. There's all kinds of rivers, lakes, savanna, rainforest, deserts, it's all there. So get your basic knowledge and on uh, whatever you're teaching. And if you need help, contact um, Elsa Vija at BU's African Study Center or at one of the other outreach programs nationally. Now, the next one. We're gonna look at two things for evaluating materials. First, we're gonna take a look at the Kids National Geographic on Kenya. And then um, I'll give you a guide for te evaluating teaching materials and that guide will be in the resource list. So, on to the next, please. National Geographic Kids. I thought, wow, 
what a resource. You know, we go to, we look at Kenya through National Geographic. They're such a good organization. There, it's gonna be tops. Well, I almost got sick when I saw what they did to Kenya, where I have spent many months with friends or co-leading a Fulbright study tour for teachers. The first slide, they show, they show four photographs of uh, Kenya in order to show you Kenya. Kenya is 30% urban. The first photo they show you is, guess what? It's a, it's a zebra. And then just below the zebra, they say, chances are, you know what Kenya already looks like. You already know what Kenya looks like. Are you kidding me? You don't already know what Kenya looks like. You know what wildlife looks like in the savannah, but do you know what the cities look like? Do you know what the coastline looks like? Do you know the old forts and um, mercantile mansions um, from the 16th century? Oh, no, you don't know what Kenya looks like. And so they start with that one and then they say, oh, then they show you the next one, which is the parliament building in Nairobi with no people around. That's the only urban shot they show. No people. The next slide is of a lone man in a dugout canoe fishing on a lake. You see such, you see men like that. And you also see men with larger boats, motors too, that get um, the tilapia to send to Europe from the market. So Kenya is not isolated. And it's not about wildlife, at least not to the Kenyans. The final slide they show is a group of Maasai women in their red clothes and beaded, famous beaded jewelry. Okay. But the Maasai are a tiny part of Kenya's population as a group. They are as typical of Kenya as the Amish are of the United States. And National Geographic Kids Kenya showed two photos of, of the Maasai, one photo of the man fishing, and no other photos of people. As I said, it broke my heart. I took a look at the other National Geographic Kids programs on different African countries, none of them None of them, all of them stereotype. And they give other information as well. It's not just the four photos. Um, and the information they give sometimes is wrong um, and sometimes it's irrelevant. And occasionally it's relevant. So, um, but the photos. Uh, 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 uh. So let's look at a guide to evaluate material. So what's important to know is these things in relation to that um, National Geographic kids, I was so disappointed. And I mention it not because I want to bash National Geographic. No, I mention it because National Geographic is so respected and so widely used. I wanted you to be careful on Africa. And this isn't the only time they've done it. I've seen them do it a number of other times um, in other places and other kinds of articles. So uh, on to the next one. And now here are questions for evaluating and um, to ask in evaluating materials. All of these questions are in your resource list. Now the most important, and I'm gonna deal with them in a slightly different way than you see on this list because I realized that they could be grouped together. First, use your VVC lens because that is critical. The second thing is you're gonna to wanna to focus on people. You want kids to connect with people. 
Um, that's the first thing. Then you can connect them with problems and you can connect them with ways that they're solving problems. You can connect them with um, things they like to do. Most popular sport in Africa is soccer. Um, so you can have soccer photos from different parts of Africa. Ghana almost beat the United States in the World Cup a few years back. So we want people. And so there are a number of people photographs, um, questions here. Is there a range of typical jobs? Are, do you see children in school? Are they playing soccer? Um, and um, do you see people having fun? Let's get away from the abject poor African in a refugee camp. Um, lots of celebrations. Be great to see people at a celebration, whether it be a wedding, whether it be um, um, a birth, whether it be something we don't have here in the United States. So you want family scenes too, because families are at the core of African social life. And um, half of the photos should be urban if you've got photos of places. And that's a very high bar. So if you don't have half of the photos being urban, then pay, have the students pay particular attention to the urban photos. And we have online in the resource list, a guide to using photographs for teaching about Africa. Now, you could also talk about famous places, the ancient mosque uh, in Mopti in Mali, or the Kente, Weaver, Kente Weaving Village in Ghana. Um, so you, another thing you could do is with um, picture books, is to look for picture books that display similar, similar kinds of situations, but in very different locales. So one picture book I love from Egypt is um, uh, the day Ahmed, um, I think it's the, the day of Ahmed's secret, something like close to that, it's on your list. And Ahmed is a boy who doesn't, who goes to school, but also sp spends a good part of his day um, with a cart, um, taking things from place to place for money for people, um, for his family, to make money for the family. And he comes home one day just bursting with happiness. And he says, look what I can do. And he pulled out a piece of paper and a pencil and he wrote his name. There's also, um, I lost my tooth in Africa. Um, and it tells of what happens in Mali when a little girl whose family lives in Mali in the United States, uh, what happened when she lost her tooth. The author wanted to say, right, I lost my tooth in Mali and the publisher, American publisher said, it will not sell. And so she wrote, they wrote, I lost my tooth in Africa, written by a Malian father and daughter. So there's a lot, a lot of ways that you can get to this. And now, let me just make sure we're getting to it. Okay, now we're gonna go on to the next slide. And we're getting on to our final and big topic. And this is about um, environmental justice through literature. You will soon hear Wangari Mathai, Nobel Peace Prize winner, tell a story about a fire and a small hummingbird. The other story that you will um, hear um, is Gizo Gizo. It's a contemporary fable about people cleaning up a lagoon, except since this is what happens in African folk tales, they use animals to describe these nasty characters and good characters. Um, and that way it's more polite than saying, oh, Mr. So-and-so, you can't believe what he did as the president of G or whatever it is, as the mayor of my town. So 
Um, we're gonna, environmental justice is especially important because Africa's environment is changing much more rapidly because of climate change than the environment in the United States or in Europe. What the United States and Europe and China and India have done is that they have shared their pollution. They have shared the climate change with the whole world. Africa receives, gets more damage from climate change than just about any part of the world. Damage that it did not cause. Think about that. Now, now are we thinking about it? Let me just give you a couple of examples. Com countries near the equator in Africa are heating up much faster than most places in the world. In Southern Africa, they're, they expect the temperature to rise by, one, by two to three degrees Celsius. And what we're hoping is that the world will stop, um, the temperature will stop rising below at one and a half Celsius, not two or three. So things are looking really difficult. What it means in Southern Africa, and that's the whole region of what, 12 countries, 10 countries. It means that the rains are shorter, they're less predictable. An example, two years ago, the large city of Cape Town almost had to turn off the water because there was no water left. They were within days of having to turn off the water. Uh, and people conserved like mad in order to make, to prevent that. Um, it was a citywide effort. They succeeded and they spared themselves, though the environmentalists say another day will come. Maybe not for 10 years, maybe 20. In Botswana, where I lived for a number of years, um, droughts used to come about every seven years. Now they come most years, not severe droughts. The severe droughts come only every few years, mm, every four years or five years. But the, the ordinary droughts come seven years out of 10. There's not enough rain. Not enough rains mean you don't plant crops or you plant crops and they don't bring up they don't fruit and you may lose some of your cattle because there's not enough water for your cattle. So when you think about climate change, think about doing it not just for the United States, but Africa owes, we owe Africa some reparations for what we're doing. So now let's go on to Wangari Mathai. And let me tell you one thing about her that you don't yet know. Well, it's right there on the slide. She won the Nobel Peace Prize. She was the first environmentalist to win it. And she won it because she developed a movement to bring women together to plant over 50 million trees, improving the soil. Uh, she also did other environmental gestures, trying to stop the government from destroying places. And for that, she was put in prison and beaten badly, uh, came out and continued on. She became somebody that the whole country respected and the government couldn't touch. Now, what you're gonna want, you're gonna be watching a folktale that she made up and is told, it's very short. And what I'd like you to think about as you're watching it is um, how much you use this in class. So let's go to the folktale. This is on your um, resource list. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen really quick and then reshare it to minimize okay. um, or to maximize the sound. So everybody can take a deep breath. My advice is look away from the screen because it's better for your eyes. Just 
until Wangari starts talking or close your eyes. You might even stretch your arms. This is what I do when I am an assistant teacher in ESL class. Here we go. Can everyone hear the video? Not yet. Okay. Yes. We are constantly being bombarded by problems that we face. And sometimes we can get completely overwhelmed. The story of the hummingbird is about this huge forest consumed by a fire. All the animals in the forest come up and they are transfixed as they watch the forest burning and they feel very overwhelmed, very powerless except this little hummingbird. It says, I'm um, doing something Beth, if you could hear me, it's not working the sound well. It, okay. It's choppy. Okay. I mean, if that's what we have to deal with, that's what we have to deal with. Let's see here. But you and I have heard it when it wasn't choppy. And so if we can't make it unchoppy, go and watch it yourself on YouTube. It's fabulous. She's one of my heroes and I'll just, I'll just keep, I'll just finish the video with the choppy sound okay. link it at the end. Okay. can only bring a small drop of water at a time, but as they continue to discourage it, it turns to them without wasting any time and tells them, I'm doing the best I can. And that to me is what all of us should do. We should always feel like a hummingbird. I may feel insignificant, but I certainly don't want to be like the animals watching as the planet goes down the drain. I will be a hummingbird. I will do the best I can. Ah, Wangara Mathai. Um, there are two picture books about of her biography, two award-winning picture books. So I encourage you to, to check those out too. Now. Before we go on to, oh, right. Before we go, let's go back to the previous one of picture, picture of her. And let me um, ask you what, did, what were your ideas for using this in class? Any thoughts? Put them on chat. Beth, am I heard by people? I, I think we have some ideas now. Oh. One person asked, should we use her picture, her, her story or talk about her life? Um, I'd say you could do both um, because that makes her come alive. She's a real person and there are countless videos of her. She came and spoke at our university um, to a select group um, and the joy she brought to her message um, was 
inspired me. Um, so, yeah, hers is a contemporary folktale, you're right. Now, one thing about folktales, before we go on to the next um, story, is that folktales in Africa, different from mostly, mostly different from Europe, are about animals. People don't want to talk about the guy next door, so they talk about um, Anansi the spider or Anansi's pals or somebody else. So remind students that this isn't all about wildlife. This is about people. Now we're going to listen to Gizo Gizo. And what you're going to hear is not only the story read by the author, one of the authors, as you can see, Emily Williamson wrote it with the students and teachers of a Quranic school in Ghana. And so you'll learn about her, their writing process uh, briefly, and then you'll hear the story itself. And then if you continue on in it afterwards, um, back in your classroom, you will see all the teaching ideas that she presented at the Library of Congress. So before you start watching, remember to ask yourself um, two things. Who has agency here and how much? And the second question is, how did, how did the animals, the crab and the others come to a decision? Okay, let's roll them. All right, this time I'm gonna put the closed captioning on in case the sound. Oh, uh, good yeah. idea, Beth, thanks. All right, so we're starting with 1542. And then this, guess what this is? Yes, it's the out, so it's their school is outside and, and they actually string up little tents, little canopies and then they work under those canopies in the shade. So when we wrote and illustrated this book right here, and this is us working on the book. Yeah, that's me. This is, yeah, been there many times. <laughs> so that's me. This is my friend Catherine who helped on the book. This is one of the teachers. His name is Owl who says hello to all of you today. And these are some of the students. These are the kids working on the story. So the children, it's a huge age range. Can you guess by looking at these photographs? Four. Four, good. To, to what? Six and five. Six and five? Eight. Eight. So the oldest child was 16 who was working on the story. Mm -hmm. So it was wonderful because the younger ch children helped a lot with the illustrations and then the older kids tended to enjoy the writing. And so we worked together and created this book collaboratively. So there's some people, some of the students like to work individually. Some just like to, <laughs> to put their, it, that's basically the equivalent of their clipboard, okay? <laughs> Except they can write directly on it. So he happens to be balancing on his head. Some pictures of the students. Everyone's very focused. So one thing I want to do at the end of today's presentation is to give you guys the opportunity to also do a little bit of drawing and to help us think about a new story. Okay, so I want to stop with this one right now and I want to read you the story. And then after I'm done reading, what I would like to do is a short art activity. So combining drawing and writing about your, a character, okay? So when I'm reading the story, you can think about a character that you might be interested in drawing and writing about that maybe Gizo Gizo meets, okay? So you can oh, see these are- My apologies. We're having to move it to another place. Okay. Yeah. Oh, start back at the beginning. The next segment is. 
the beginning of her reading the story. That looks like the beginning. Satanan Ku. Perfect. <laughs> okay, Gizo Gizo, a tale from the Zongo Lagoon. Not so very long ago, many animals lived in the Zongo Lagoon. Fish basked in the clear, clean waters, frogs sang in the tall green grasses, lizards scurried up and down the trunks of the leafy moringa trees. And down by the watery edge of the peaceful lagoon that flowed into the sea lived three best friends, crab, tortoise, and spider. A fisherman by trade, Crab was generous and hardworking. He spent most of his time at the bottom of the lagoon with his family or hauling fish into his canoe. Tortoise was wise and very patient. Animals came to him for advice and to buy the medicines he made from the healing roots and leaves. Unlike the other two, Spider was lazy, selfish. When he wasn't lounging around in his favorite moringa tree, Overlooking the lagoon, he was mining for gold upstream and dreamt of being rich. Despite their differences, crab, tortoise, and spider ate dinner together every day at high tide. Crab caught the fish, tortoise blessed the kenke, and spider ate greedily. One day after dinner, instead of throwing his rubbish into the dustbin, Spider tossed his kenke leaves and plantain peels right into the lagoon. A boki, Crab pleaded, using the Hausa name for friend. You must respect the lagoon. It belongs to all of us. Bah, Spider balked. A little rubbish is no big deal. I own a mining business. Someday, when I am rich, I will buy this place. I can do whatever I want. Rainy season came and Spider's bad habits grew worse. He tossed his used water sachets, empty mineral bottles, and old cans of milk right into the lagoon. The water turned green and soupy and no longer flowed into the sea. The tall grasses were filthy and smelly. The banks were muddy and bare. Piles of garbage were everywhere. Gizo, Gizo, Crab begged. You must respect the lagoon. It belongs to all of us. Ha, Spider bragged. My mining business is booming. A little rubbish is no big deal. Someday, when I am rich, I will buy this place. I can do whatever I want. Dry season came and Spider's habits grew even worse. His huge new factory polluted the lagoon with chemicals, oil, and waste. The animals got sick. Fish groaned with empty stomachs. Frogs winced from sore throats. Lizards moaned from aching legs. They all went to Tortoise and asked for healing roots and leaves. There was very little left. Tortoise boiled the last of the bazobo flowers to settle the fish's upset stomachs. He pounded the last of the moringa leaves to relieve the lizard's aching legs. He mixed the last of his salt with clean water to soothe the frog's sore throats. Crab shook his head sadly and said, this has gone on far too long. We must talk some sense into Spider's head. The next day, Crab and Tortoise invited Spider to dinner his favorite meal of fried fish and kenke. Look, he wrote a letter. Dear Gizo Gizo, you're invited for fried fish and kenke on Saturday at high tide, crab and tortoise. Spider sat down at the table and ate greedily without so much as a glance at his friends who didn't eat one bite. Little did Spider know that crab had caught the fish from the polluted Zongo Lagoon and that the kenke was rotten. Soon, Spider grew very ill. His legs ached so badly, he couldn't climb down from his moringa tree. He tried to call to Tortoise for help, but his throat was too sore. He moaned and groaned from his upset stomach. Oh, what did I do, Spider cried. I have ruined our lagoon. Crab and Tortoise smiled. Perhaps Spider had learned his lesson. Gizo, Gizo, said Crab. 
There is only one thing to do. You must clean up the lagoon and never dump rubbish into it. Tortoise nodded wisely and added, you must respect the lagoon. It belongs to all of us. When Spider finally felt better, he set to work busily cleaning the lagoon. He turned his mining business into a place that cleaned water. He collected rubbish from the high grasses and removed the piles of garbage from the bases of the moringa trees. After many, many days of hard work, fish basked in the clear, clean waters, frogs sang in the tall green grasses, lizards scurried up and down the trunks of the leafy moringa trees. Life was peaceful once again in the Zongo Lagoon. So crab, tortoise, and spider enjoyed a dinner of fried fish and kenke together at high tide. Crab caught the fish, tortoise blessed the meal, and spider made an announcement. I've learned my lesson, said Spider to his old friends. As my great, great grandfather used to say, the lagoon's water is sacred. It belongs to no one and everyone at the same time. It takes only one day to destroy it and many, many days to restore it. We must keep it clean every single day. And then they end the story saying, Kurankus. All right, Barbara, are you ready? Um, am I ready for the next piece? Yes. Who did you see in the story who had agency? Put it in chat. Beth, am I missing something? I don't see anything in chat. Yeah, I don't see anyone either. Did everyone hear? Oh, we have a comment from Brittany. In some ways, the crab, yes, here we go. Here are some comments. The crab, sometimes the crab and the tortoise do when they make a plan for the spider to be affected by his choices. What a great thing. The spider had agency and then he lost it because of his pals, the crab and the tortoise. So yeah, the spider had a lot more agency. Did you notice who he stood in for? He stood in for the gold mining company that was polluting the lagoon. So there's a modern element that's in here. And the locals have a agency. And what Emily Dickin, um, Williamson didn't say in this piece of the program is that she, she was doing research on how um, the adults saw problems of the, their, in their environment. And then she thought, well, I should be asking children too. And so that's how that came about. And the other question was about um, how did crab and the other, um, and the tortoise decide. 
we don't have really enough time for that. So I'll just leave you with that thought that, and thinking about group and the power of a group and the power of coming together and talking together and making a decision. A another thing you could ask your students is the values that this shorts, that this tale is, is teaching because African folk tales almost invariably teach a value. Um, they're rarely scary folk tales. Um, and then someone of course will point some out to me, but that's um, being in general. Uh, and I know you'll have a lot more um, ideas. So let's just move on to the next slide. The Children's Africana Book Award, 26, 27 years old, is the best place to go to find the best children's book on Africa. They have had dozens of books that have been received awards over the last number of years that have been biographies, that have been folk tales, that have been just plain old stories, just a whole variety of different ways. And there are also books, by the way, for those of you who are in middle school or high school, there are books for high school students. Um, the books for the middle school students are called for older, for young adults. And then the other award is for older readers. And there's an honor book and um, another one. So go there. And they're also teaching guides for using the, some of those books. Now, with a deep breath, let's go to the last slide. And what I want you to do, because we whirled through a whole lot here, is to take a deep breath and take five minutes to write takeaways from this session, the, the big ideas that you're walking away with so that you don't walk away and find that a few hours it's a blur, okay? And um, I'm actually gonna stop sharing so I can get those resources to everyone. Okay, good. The program will end at, this piece of the program will end at 10 of 6. And then if you'd like to come back in just over an hour at 7 o'clock, 7 o'clock Eastern time, um, is there is a fabulous film called Black and Black, which is about African Americans and Africans and their connections and their relations. Uh, it's done by Zari Zoku. Uh, Cote d'Ivoirian uh, documentary filmmaker who's had a number of other films that he's made. He's a former elementary school teacher in Cote d'Ivoire and uh, he's wonderful. So um, come back, stay tuned or take a break. And um, I just wanna end by saying, thank you all for being here. It's been wonderful and I was, so pleased at your responsiveness and your your thoughtfulness and um good night also there is a survey that i'm about to link with everything if y'all are willing to stick around just ah, a yes. um so Thank please you, don't beth. forget to fill out the survey beth is right that would be helpful it'll be helpful to me because i'm always fine tuning especially since this is the Second Zoom workshop I've ever done. Anybody who'd like to write me a note is welcome to write me a note. The survey will get you credit for PDPs or PDs. Someone said they can't find the resource list.
Is it just an outline? Oh, and by the way, I'm still here in case, just reading the chat. Um, so if anybody has any questions, feel free to type them in. Beth, is a survey um, on chat, available on chat? Yes, I linked that. Yes, okay, and Lauren good. linked it again. Good. Barbara, do you happen to have a copy of the resource list? I'm having a hard time locating it. No, I don't have a copy. Okay. Um, Beth does. I mean, Beth, <laughs> sorry, Elsa does. Um, you mean it's not, it's not coming up for people? Beth, is that, is that what's happening? Um, yeah, I'm having a hard time finding a link to the list that you referenced. That would have come from Elsa, not from me. Yeah, that I'm, I'm having a hard time. Um, is there a way to capture people's emails so that we can send it out to them if you yes if everyone wants to if that's interested in the resource list wants to put their email in the chat i will copy it and i can forward it to you okay everyone did you hear that yes i'm getting email we'll send it to you by email just put in your email in the chat box and we're sorry for Thank the you. difficulty Yes, thank you so much. I really appreciate everyone's patience. And then Beth, will you um, write down all of the emails for me, please? Yes, I'm doing it now. Uh, thanks. Barbara, do you want to put your email address in the chat for people if they have questions? Sure. Sure.
All right, perfect. I think I have everyone's email. Barbara, do you have any closing, final, most final of all remarks? No, except to say, um, I hope you've seen how important this work is in changing how we see um, Black people and how we see in particular Africans and how to de-exoticize them how to make them companions in this world. Um, because bato ke bato kabato. People are people through people. Goodbye. Take care, everyone. And I really encourage everyone to come for the documentary. Yes. And Beth, thank you. And Lauren, thank you for being the backup. So long.